I'm Alex Michelson. This week, the issue is the GOP has a House majority. What are they going to do with it? Republican Kevin Kiley was just elected to represent part of Northern California. He's with us from freshman orientation. Then the issue is Governor Newsom's message to President Biden on election night about 2024. Only one journalist was in the room to hear it. Jonathan Martin of Politico is that journalist. He'll be with us to break it down. And John McEntee will be in studio. The former body man to President Trump is now the founder and CEO of a conservative dating app, giving a whole new definition to swiping right. The issue is starts right now. Broadcasting across California. You're watching The Issue Is. And welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson. Orientation is underway in Washington right now as Republicans prepare to take over the House of Representatives. One of the members that put them over the top for that majority is a Californian, Kevin Kiley. Kiley is currently a member of the California Assembly. He was first elected there in 2016. We often spoke with him here on The Issue Is as he ran for governor during the Newsom recall race. He holds a bachelor's from Harvard, a law degree from Yale, and he began his career as a teacher in Los Angeles. Congressman-elect Kevin Kiley, welcome back to The Issue Is, and congratulations on the new gig. Well, thanks very much, Alex. Uh, great to be back. All right, so you are joining us right now from freshman orientation in Washington, D.C. You're on Capitol Hill. Take us behind the scenes. What's it like there, and, and is it kind of surreal to be there? Uh, it's a little surreal in the sense that, you know, uh, the election day was a Tuesday and then it's like three days later you're in D.C. for orientation. And so, uh, you know, it, it all happened very quickly. But uh, it's uh, it's fun to sort of meet uh, the new members from all around the country. I think there's about 75 uh, freshman members for the, the 118th Congress, which is what we've got coming up. All right. We'd like to get some quick takes on some big issues that we're confronting right now. I know you say that the economy is priority one. What substance are the Republicans going to do in the House to address inflation? Well, I think you're going to see us take uh, action immediately. First and foremost, that means reining in spending. You know, uh, Nancy Pelosi's Congress went on a $4 trillion uh, spending spree. Uh, even Larry Summers, who was Barack Obama's top economic advisor, said, don't do that. It's going to create an inflation crisis. And of course, uh, that's exactly what happened. Number two is rolling back all of these uh, regulations that have been put in place and have raised the cost of doing business. And those prices have been passed on to consumers, have contributed to inflation. Um, number three, Three is reactivating our workforce, giving folks an incentive to work when we've had too many incentives uh, not to work. Uh, I'd say number four is fixing various issues with our supply chain, uh, one of which, by the way, uh, is a California law, AB5, that uh, Joe Biden wants to make uh, into federal policy, it essentially bans independent contracting and has taken truckers uh, off the road. And then I'd say number five is making our country energy independent, increasing domestic energy production uh, so that we're not reliant uh, on foreign countries. Uh, for our energy supply. Let's also talk about another issue, which is, which is the border. Uh, what substantively are House Republicans going to do different to address the border crisis? Uh, here again, it's not really that complicated. We just need to go back to the policies that were working uh, that this administration got rid of, policies like uh, the Remain in Mexico policy or uh, beefing up our border patrol uh, or ending sanctuary policies like California has and the incentives uh, that to, for illegal border crossings uh, that have been put in place. Does Kevin McCarthy have your support to be the next Speaker of the House? Yes, he does. He was uh, nominated by uh, our conference uh, as our nominee uh, for speaker, and I fully expect that will be formalized uh, in a vote of the full House uh, on January 3rd. Let's talk about the job you're leaving. Uh, for years, you have made the case as articulately as anybody in the state against Gavin Newsom in California. Yet he keeps winning sure. by massive margins. No Republican has won statewide since 2006. Why do you think so many voters in this state disagree with you? Well, Alex, actually, I don't think he uh, he did win. He seemed to think his opponent was Ron DeSantis, and Ron DeSantis actually got uh, a higher vote share than Gavin Newsom did. And I he think won when by you look 20 on points, though. 
I think when you look on specific issues, uh, you see people are highly dissatisfied uh, with the direction of the state, uh, highly dissatisfied uh, with the homelessness situation, highly dissatisfied when it comes to crime. We've seen uh, how California is now leading the nation in all the wrong ways when it comes to poverty, when it comes uh, to homelessness, when it comes to the achievement gaps in our schools. And yet I now see the Biden administration uh, implementing a lot of the same policies that have created these problems here. And even Gavin Newsom is going around saying California is a model for the nation. Uh, so I want to make it very clear in my role as a Congress member from California that no, California is not a model for the nation. In many ways, we're a warning to the nation about how even uh, you know the best, greatest state in the country can become the most popular state to leave uh, if you make the wrong choices uh, when it comes to uh, you know uh, your political leadership. All right, obviously there's big issues to talk about. We always like to have a little bit of fun on this show too. So we play a game called Personal Issues, which you've played before, which is 30 seconds to get to know your favorites. And since we're now in this holiday season, this is going to be a holiday version of your favorites. Are you ready? Let's do it. Okay. Uh, what is your favorite holiday movie? Home Alone. Favorite holiday song? Oh man, uh, let's go with 12 Days of Christmas. What's your favorite holiday food? Eggnog. Does that count? Food, that counts, beverage? I guess. What, what, do you have a favorite holiday dessert? Uh, <laughs> wow. Um, I think eggnog's dessertish, don't yeah, you, Alex? Yeah, it kind of kind of could work for both. And do you have a favorite holiday tradition? What's what's uh, Christmas like with Kevin Kyle? You know, I really love seeing Christmas lights. Uh, go into the neighborhoods that do the best job, uh, where everyone sort of goes all out. I think that's uh, that's really fun. All right, well, a happy holidays to you, uh, and congratulations once again. Congressman-elect Kevin Kiley, great to see you. Thanks very much, likewise. Next week on The Issue Is, we'll get the Democratic perspective from Democrat Robert Garcia from Long Beach, who was just elected president of the Democratic freshman class. Up next this week on The Issue Is, Jonathan Martin joins us with what he overheard between Governor Newsom and President Biden on election night. But as we go to break, some holiday cheer. Three, two, one, here we go! Oh, yeah, okay! Oh, beautiful. President Biden lighting the official national Christmas tree in Washington this week in the 100th annual celebration. We all have a responsibility to do a little bit more to meet people where they are. On the night when he won re-election as California governor, Gavin Newsom did not answer any questions from the assembled Sacramento press corps. He did invite Politico columnist Jonathan Martin to join him at the governor's mansion. And the result of that was this column titled, Newsom told the White House that he won't challenge Biden. The president of the Sacramento Press Club, Alexi Kossif of CalMatters, reacted with this tweet, says, quote, Newsom declined to answer any questions from the Capitol press corps after his victory speech on election night. Then he spent the evening with a DC columnist to prove his disinterest in national politics. That columnist is Jonathan Martin. He joins us now via Zoom from New Orleans. Uh, Jonathan, you were a top reporter at the New York Times. We talked to you recently when you had a big book out. Now you've got this yeah. new Politico column, which is must read. Every column you've had has got like incredible buzz. Congrats on the success. Thanks so much, Alex. It's, it's, it's great to be back and uh, enjoy being with you on the book earlier this year, and just sorry I'm not in LA with you. I know, so, you know, in Hamilton, you know, there's that great song, The, the Room Where It Happens. Everybody wants to be yeah. in the room where it happens. Yeah. You were in the room where it happens with Governor Newsom on election yeah. night. Take us behind the scenes sure. of this incredible night and this incredible phone call that you listened in on. Sure, so uh, I joined the governor and his family and some of his supporters in the mansion. As a lot of your viewers know, it's mostly a ceremonial uh, building. Uh, very few governors uh, actually live there. I just happened to leave the hotel at the same time as Newsom after that press conference. And I caught Newsom on the sidewalk about to get into his motorcade talking on his cell phone. And I walked up and sure enough, he was taking a congratulatory phone call from President Biden uh, about his own reelections. So I was able to listen in just for a couple of minutes on Newsom's side of the conversation. And the governor didn't know I was there. His back was to the sidewalk where I was standing. But I overheard him tell Biden, you know, put me in, coach. I'm ready. Let's go. And what he meant by that, Alex, was, you know, sign me up to be a big Biden surrogate in 24. I'm a team player here. I want to be on the your reelection 
uh, campaign. I'm, I'm not a threat. Uh, I'm a supporter. And it sort of evokes that whole uh, put me in coach, I'm ready to play song, uh, which yes. uh, he didn't yes. start singing, apparently. But, uh, you know, there, there was this trip that he took to D.C. that we were yeah. on um, a yeah. few months back in, in, in the summer. And right. you, he told you what he told to the first lady and the White House chief of staff during that trip. What did he say? Well, he told both Ron Klain, the chief of staff, and Joe Biden, the first lady, look, I'm not running. You know, don't worry about me. Because, you know, I, as you recall, Alex, at, at, at last summer, uh, that was really the height of the speculation among Democrats in Washington and beyond that Newsom started to sort of nose around about challenging Joe Biden in the primary, which, by the way, would not be the first time a California governor uh, challenged his own incumbent president primary. You guys have a tradition of that. Uh, thank you, Ronald Reagan and Jerry Brown. Yeah, and, and literally seconds after that conversation, he walked out the building and came to us, and I asked him about it. Here's what he said back then. There are a lot of people that are talking about you running there and potentially being comfortable there. What do you say when you see that? There's no part of you at all? No, thinks? because I, I don't know, you know, it's, it's one of those things. I, I've tried to say no, no way, in every way I possibly can. <laughs> So it, it makes logical sense to me that Newsom yeah. would not challenge Joe Biden in 2024. Yes. yes. But he's also gone one step further, saying that he yeah. has no interest in ever running for president, even if yeah. Biden isn't running, not yeah. in 2028. Do you right. buy that? I, I'm as skeptical as you are, Alex, about that. He's a politician. He's the governor of the largest state in America. He's, he's tamping down speculation now. He does not want to be seen as somebody who is challenging Biden or undercutting Biden, in part because I think Democrats right now are kind of rallying to Biden because they they want to play it safe to keep Trump away from the White House again. What are people saying behind the scenes right now on the idea of whether Joe Biden actually is going to run in 2024? I think right now, because of the Democrats' surprising midterm, Biden continues to enjoy uh, this sort of um, this silence across the top ranks of his party with regard to 2024. I think there's a sense among Democrats that Biden has earned a few months grace, that we ought to let him figure this out uh, and, and sort of not try to jam him. I think that's a very different scenario than it would have been. In fact, I know so if Democrats had had a rough night uh, in the midterms. I think 23, Alex, is going to be one of the most extraordinary years in modern American politics because I can't recall a time when the two national parties went into a presidential cycle with so much looming uncertainty as to who their nominee is going to be. Um, totally plausible that it could be a rematch of Biden and Trump. But I think also totally plausible that you can see Biden decide not to run again and have a robust Democratic primary. And totally, I think, possible that Trump could either uh, be indicted and convicted or uh, lose a primary and not be the nominee. And it is possible you might end up with Newsom DeSantis. You know, who knows? And if you listen to Gavin Newsom for longer than 10 seconds, uh, Alex, uh, it won't take long before you hear a reference to Ron DeSantis yeah. in some way, shape, or form. In the Aaron Sorkin version of the Democratic Party today, right, that would be the kind of match, right? Um, you know, hairspray versus hair gel, uh, <laughs> as, as Newsom himself put it. Um, but, you know, politics is not scripted. Uh, Alex by Aaron Sorkin these days. By the way, as a huge West Wing fan and Hamilton fan, I'm glad we're able to reference both in this episode, which should be called Hairspray versus Hair Gel. Uh, Jonathan Martin, <laughs> thank you so much for sharing your perspective. Read his column uh, in Thanks. Politico. Up next, we're going to talk to a top Trump ally who will be with us to share his perspective and talk about dating on the right via the right stuff. We go to break with Governor Newsom and his family lighting the Capitol Christmas tree in Sacramento. America's comeback starts right now. As we know, President Trump is running again. Some of his former allies are with him. Some might run against him. One of his most loyal lieutenants has been John McEntee. He was a body man, spending about as much time with him as anybody in the administration. And then he ran White House personnel for him. 
John, who is a SoCal native, is out with a new dating app for conservatives called The Right Stuff, where swiping right has a whole new meeting. John McEntee <laughs> is here with us in the studio. Welcome to the issue is for the first time. Thank you for having Thanks me. Thanks for being here. We appreciate it. We will talk more about the dating app in a moment because I'm fascinated by that. <laughs> but let's start with some of the news. Trump is running again. Are, are you with him? I'm 100% with him. I've been with him from day one. Uh, we're all excited about it. What do you make of the way that it's going so far? I think uh, we're seeing a lot of parallels to 2016 with sort of the establishment and a lot of the pundit class not backing him. Right. Um, so I think we'll see a lot of the same challenges, but I would put my money on him. So you know a lot about like how people get in front of him because you were around him. And you, you know the recent controversy. He goes to has a meal with Kanye West and Nick Fuentes, uh, who have both been very anti-Semitic recently. How does that happen, and what do you make of that meeting? So one of the greatest things about Donald Trump is he'll meet with anyone, he'll talk to anyone. I think that's why he was so good in foreign policy. He'll sit down with anyone. He went to Korea to see Kim Jong-un. He's obviously been, been in the celebrity world for a long time. Kanye West is a massive celebrity, so if he says, I want to have dinner with you, of course he would. This was before the most recent stuff. Um, so I don't find that out of the ordinary at all. I think it's problematic, though? I don't think it's problematic. No, I think, you know, he can have dinner with whoever he wants. And uh, if you have dinner with someone, you're not exactly endorsing their life philosophy or just having dinner. And I think a lot of the controversial stuff that's come out probably wasn't addressed at that dinner. So... Yeah. What do you, what, because there are a lot of misconceptions, I think, about him, but a lot of people who haven't met him. What's he actually like to, to work for? He's a great boss. He's obviously a lot of fun. Um, but he's also been dominant in so many different areas that he has this vast knowledge of real estate business, you know, the celebrity world, television, politics. So he's just fun to be around. And you can just learn so much being, uh, being with him. You obviously were in charge of personnel. We know some of the high profile people that worked for him, chiefs of staff, secretaries of state, secretaries of defense, left with not as glowing reviews as you. <laughs> Why do you think that is? I think some people have an incentive to do that. They're trying to sell a book. And I think um, when people weren't up to the task, they wanted to say it was because of this or that when it was really, uh, they just had to look in the mirror and they weren't up to it. So I think, uh, I think anybody that doesn't have an incentive to lie isn't doing a book deal. If you ask them, if they work closely with them, they'll have only good things to say. All right, let's talk about what you're doing now, which is The Right Stuff, this dating app. What's the story behind it? How does it work? It's a dating app for conservatives. If you're a single conservative in Los Angeles, New York, DC, anywhere, it's, it's tough. Um, the organic ways don't really work as well anymore. And you know we live in a digital world. Our lives are, are lived through dating apps, social media, mobile apps. Um, but the current platforms don't serve conservatives well. So we're putting all conservatives in one place and making it a lot easier to find each other. Because this idea that on some of these other apps, people will say, if you're a Trump supporter, you're an automatic swipe left sort right. of thing. So on your app, everybody uh, is in that space. You've been doing it for a little while now, about a month or so. How's, yeah, it, how's it going? We've been live for six weeks. Yeah. It's going great. Steady growth. Have you heard from Trump about this concept? I told him the idea about a year and a half ago. He loved it. He loved the name. Uh, I told him just what I was up to, what I was working on. I haven't spoken to him recently about it, but uh, he liked the idea. And are you starting to see people match up? We're starting to see people match up. We have people flying all over the country to meet each other. We started with a lot of conservative influencers that are already traveling through the country. And uh, yeah, it's just a, an easier way for them to all meet. I know one thing that may be a draw for some people is you're on the app too, right? I am on looking, the app. Looking for love potentially? I'm potentially looking for love, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm that? 32, you know, so I'm just, uh, I'm mostly just testing the app. I want to get people's feedback, um, but I'm using it and uh, it's going great. Yeah. All right, well, one of the things we do on this show anyways with our guests is, is a game called Personal Issues, where okay. we put 30 seconds on the clock, get to know your favorites. Uh, now, it makes even more sense now to do this with you as a potential, you know, dating suitor. So here we go. Uh, favorite, uh, what is your all-time favorite TV show? All-time favorite, well my current favorite TV show is Tucker Carlson Tonight. <laughs> uh, all-time would be tough. Um, All right, we'll keep moving. Okay. What's your favorite movie? Meet Joe Black. Uh, favorite food? Uh, cheeseburger. Uh, best spot for a first date? Uh, movie, so you don't have to talk. <laughs> what is your favorite sport to play? Uh, football. And um, who's your role model? My role model would be my dad. Okay, what's he, what's he like? He's great, small business owner, he's been working his whole life. 
Uh, so you say football. Some people may or may not know this. You played football at UConn, and, and you were also known for this extraordinary ability to do <laughs> trick shots. And we have some video of this. You put out this video, and it got like 11 million hits, right, of you doing all these trick shots over the years. There's you doing that. Tell us a little bit about this skill, and, and are you still doing some of these? I'm not still doing some of these. This was a snow day. We had a lot of time on our hands. <laughs> when I was, you know, a third-string quarterback, I had a lot of time to mess around. And I learned how to do all this stuff. I mean, this is amazing. Um, well, thank you so much for being here. Um, I didn't ask you who's your favorite band. Who's your favorite band or musician? Uh, musician Andy Grammer. Okay, Andy Grammer. Love Andy Grammer. Uh, well, you know, Spotify has this thing where, called Wrapped, where they give you your top artists. Um, and so they recently did that for our area. Who's the most popular artist, most popular song of the year? Any guesses on what it might be? I have no idea. Okay, well, it is Harry Styles. Okay, yeah, that makes as sense. As it was, uh, is the most popular song of the year for us. So as we go to break, we're going to play that for you. I don't know if that's your favorite music, but it's uh, it, it certainly is I for like a lot it. of people. Uh, thank you so much for being here, yeah, John thank McAtee. You. Congrats on the on the app, the right stuff. You can download it anywhere. We we'll right back. Take us to break, Harry. No, it's not the same. Christine McVie wrote Don't Stop for Fleetwood Mac, which would become the theme song for the Clinton-Gore campaign in 1992. Fleetwood Mac is one of the best-selling bands of all time, and Christine's songwriting contributions include Everywhere, Say You Love Me, Little Lies, but to me, nothing was more beautiful than Songbird. Here she was performing that on the BBC. Songbirds are singing like they know the score. And I love you, I love you, I love you like never before. Christine McVie, music icon, was 79 years old when she passed away this week. What a legacy she leaves behind. We'll see you next week for more of The Issue Is.